So here we're going to begin our conversation about the Episcopal Church's uh, canon law, its polity, its constitutions. A way to begin here is to simply think through why do we have canon law at all? Obviously, the church can't be simply reduced to any one thing. The church isn't just its polity, its governance, its canons, its liturgy, or its doctrine. But there needs to be ways to shape a common life together. What structures will exist for that? What principles guide a common life? And so canon law is one of several means of ordering the common life of the church so that it can fulfill its mission. The Church of England models this uh, in its own canon laws on earlier Western Catholic traditions of canon law. But of course, what happens in the 16th century is that papal authority is replaced with royal supremacy, which means that canon law itself has to be reconceived and reconfigured in the English Christian context. Richard Hooker reflects this way on this in the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. Quote, Good laws of church or state are participation in the divine governing of creation. Yet laws are human constructions, and sound laws are not everywhere the same, and they change. So canon law is not immutable. Canon law can change and alter as context requires. This is a very Anglican concept. And yet, the use of law is a way of reflecting how God desires to have creation ordered in some way. What happens in England is that canon law is never fully revised uh, according to new principles. Rather, there's a piecemeal approach to figuring out how the earlier Catholic canon law applies in English context. And even to this day, the canon law of the Church of England has not been fully revised from its um, 16th century origins. What happens with the Episcopal Church in the 1780s is they very intentionally create a new body of canon law designed to be reflective of this new kind of church which has a representative bodies of clergy and laity alongside of the House of Bishops. So general convention with these two houses, House of Deputies, House of Bishops. This is a new way of governing church. And so canon law is sort of built from the ground up. And so the Episcopal Church's canon law looks significantly different than Church of England canon law or canon law in other parts of the communion. Now, just as a reminder, there are three general ways that Protestant churches organize themselves according to polity. One is congregational, and this is an emphasis on local congregations and their autonomy. So we would see this clearly in things like Baptist churches. Um, Christian denominations emphasize fellowship, uh, for instance, in various Pentecostal churches. You could also see this in the United Church of Christ. There's another example, which is Presbyterian or synodical. Here, authority is exercised by ordained pastors and elders of churches that govern equally in church courts, gathering on ascending levels from session, presbytery, synod, and then general assembly. So clearly you see this in the Presbyterian Church of the United States, the Presbyterian Church of America, those are two different denominations, and various other reformed bodies, like the Reformed Church of America. And then you see Episcopal forms of government, where authority culminates in the office of the bishop, and authority is exercised by a bishop, but this can be highly varied. Um, from having really concentrated power to constitutionally restricted power. And so we can see various forms of Episcopal governance and obviously the Episcopal Church, but also the United Methodist Church and the various Lutheran bodies in the United States. So when we look at the Episcopal Church, we can see a blending of congregational, Episcopal, and synodical polities. And this will become a little bit more obvious as we move through this. 
parishes, dioceses, and national and church bodies all share in governance. And so those are actually different forms of polity working alongside each other. In general, authority in the Episcopal Church, despite the name Episcopal, authority is rather decentralized and diffused. Although there's a bishop over each diocese, you all know well how the bishop navigates authority in any given diocese with things like the standing committee, diocesan conventions or councils, and so on. General convention, though, is the primary source of authority in the Episcopal Church in terms of polity and governance, but only insofar as the representative members from dioceses that either come from the episcopate or congregations participate in general convention. So even though general convention is the greatest authority in the Episcopal Church, because it only meets every three years and because it depends on representation and participation, its authority itself uh, is diffused and varied. I hope this gives us a good beginning point for reflecting on why canon law is important and why thinking through polity is important. Just thinking about the structures of the church and the way it governs itself and regulates itself helps to navigate what the church is up to in any given point in time. For our next video, we're going to uh, kick off by looking at the constitution of the Episcopal Church.